Welcome to this recording of the Working Age Forum and our interview on technology in employment. So we're focused in the Working Age Forum on blind and visually impaired people in Ireland, such as myself, such as the participants who are tuning in live this evening, as well as uh, online through the recording. We're delighted to have with us from the NCBI technology team, NCBI Labs, JP Corcoran. Thank you, JP, for joining us for the interview. My pleasure to be here, Brendan. Hello, everybody. So one big question, JP, we wanted to ask you, and it's a personal one. Yeah. What inspired you to get involved in technology in general and specifically to work for and with people who are blind or have some form of sight loss? Oh, of course, Brendan, I'll answer that now. And I just want to say that I'm really delighted to join you and everyone here today. Um, I just wanted to credit yourself, Brendan, and the rest of the Working Age Forum team, that you're, the work that you were doing um, it must be um, held to a higher regard. Um, I know I was speaking with our uh, CTO, Kyron Amahani, earlier, and uh, we're always really impressed with, with the work you're doing. So well done on that. And uh, just before I do talk about my own background and, and my journey into technology and IT support and training in NCBI, Really, what I'm hoping to do today is give everyone here a good insight into the value of technology in supporting and in, in facilitating someone who has slight loss in a journey towards perhaps its employment, perhaps it's uh, staying in employment, or perhaps it's, it's uh, further education. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has today. And if you don't get a chance to answer the question today, you can certainly contact me after today's uh, session. So in terms of what motivated me to get involved in working in, in technology and NCBI, my background is actually not really related to what I'm doing to a degree right now, to, to a degree, I would say. Uh, my um, education is in science. I did science in, in college. That was my primary degree. I have a degree in natural science in, in Trinity College. And then I went back after my primary degree and I went back to do a master's in environmental science, something that I still am very interested in. Um, I graduated in Trinity in 2007, where environmental science, uh, climate change and so forth were, were big topics uh, that day. I think I'd actually argue it's probably even more topical uh, right now in, in light of what we're hearing on the news and you know, over 40 degrees in, in the UK two weeks ago. Um, it's something I was very passionate about at the time, and I was so passionate about it, I decided to work in that area. I was working in that area for two years as a research officer in, in Trinity College in, in Dublin, working in a research lab for two years, as I mentioned, a small group of researchers, and we were collaborating with different uh, universities, such as Princeton over in New Jersey. Um, I really enjoyed this work, and I I was in a fantastic campus, um, really selling it, um, great team, um, practicing working in an area that I was um, had experience in and just finished college in, in environmental science. I was able to apply what I had learned. And then I, I think it was about a year and a half in, and I said, well, I was coming up to around 28. I was thinking about a career change. Um, I'd always give myself around about my late 20s. If I wanted to make a career change, it's something that I was more interested in. That was the time to do it. Um, I think it was probably from Parents, my, my dad had, had done something similar. He had been working in advertising for years. At 28, he went back and did meds in, in Trinity. And I wanted to do something that I knew, I thought would be a little bit more, more job satisfaction, a bit more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. what I did was, um, this is one of the themes I want to get across today as well, guys. It's sometimes it can pay off to be a little bit persistent. So I, I applied for a position in NCBI. It was a job for a trainer, IT trainer role, support role. I said, God, this would be really interesting. And uh, I applied and I, I didn't get it. So I asked some feedback. I said, well, you, you'd need your, you'd actually need qualifications in, in IT teacher training and support. So that's fine. I said, I, I went back to college working full time. I went back to an evening course in IT teacher training. And I put this out in, in NACE in Kildare. It was uh, once a week, uh, every evening. And I drive out to Kildare and in NACE and um, was doing this for a year. Got my got my um, qualification from that. And I, another position came up, I applied. I didn't get it. I was like, oh God, I was, I was good at, I was really looking for this job, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I said, what, what, what do you need now? They said, right, well, you need some experience. So I then 
contacted a IT trainer in the NCBI and I started volunteering my time over Saturdays in the Dunleary Centre. And I was doing this for just over a year. It wasn't too intense. Look, I met maybe an hour and a half, two hours every Saturday. Um, I was doing that. I found that I really enjoyed it. I had my qualification, was able to apply what I had learned. And then the position came up again. I applied and I was given it absolutely delighted. That was 10 years ago. Um, I haven't looked back. Really, really delighted I did make that move. So my role in NCBI started off as an IT teacher, uh, IT trainer, okay? And then it kind of developed into more support. So I was able to help people who you might know, want their PC installed, set up an iPad, set up a phone. Um, so it was like kind of a bit of a learning curve. Um, and then about two years ago, um, what we did in NCBI, uh, we very had to very quickly had to shift our service delivery to a virtual model. So we were used to people coming into a service, who's coming in, seeing equipment, receiving demonstrations, support, all of that. And suddenly overnight in, in lieu of the pandemic, that all stopped. So we had to suddenly as a pivot our service delivery to a virtual model. And what we did then at this time, we started um, introduce new initiatives. And that would be, for example, our technology podcast, technology newsletter. Uh, we have virtual technology clubs, a suite of services that were mm. made available virtually. And suddenly my role started changing, as a lot of my colleagues did as well, to accommodate for that. And that's something that uh, we've been focusing on a lot that I've really concentrated on over the last two years in particular. So that my area, my key area now is digital content creation. And that's the area that I'm, that I'm working mm. in now with a team. So we're building up a team because it's really important. And even in terms of, I, I speak with my, my manager, Kyron O'Mahony, who is a chief technical officer in, in NCBI. And it's all, it's all comes into reach, really. So, of course, there's always going to need, be a need for one-to-one -one service delivery and assessments and training. But at the same time, we have this opportunity now on the back of the, this virtual service delivery model to perhaps deliver services to a group of, like, like this, you know, we have 15, 16, 20 people here today. Um, perhaps we have, you know, we've had 10,000 people listen to our technology podcast in the last two years. So it all comes into this word reach. Um, and it's not to disregard the service delivery that is continuing to be delivered one-to-one, -one, which is always needed, but it's an opportunity now where we can ex extend that reach to uh, mm. far more people, which, which is fantastic. So that's what I'm doing now. And I think the key message I say I want to get across today is that it's, well, first of all, it's never too late to find the career that you want to, to work in. And sometimes you do need to persist a little bit too. Yeah, so mm -hmm. oh, great. that question, Brendan. And, and in, in that journey, you described the different roles you've had and how you mm. persisted, uh, eventually getting to mm. NCBI Labs and then more recently, Digital Content Manager. Mm. What difference can technology make for people who are blind or partially sighted, whether they're looking for a job or in employment? It's a significant difference. Um, in NCBI Labs, uh, NCBI Labs, by the way, is the technology function, or our department within the National Council for the Blind of Ireland. So in this team, our, our mantra is that technology is the single greatest enabler for someone with sight loss. Um, and with that in mind, what we do is we, we, we recognize the power of technology to assist people with sight loss to feel more independent and support you in all walks of life, be that in the home, in education, and 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 of course, and in in, in, in employment, uh, the labs team itself, um, which is a technology function in NCBI, it's spread nationwide. So I'm based typically in our head office in Dublin. Um, this team though has a national presence, and what we do is we offer a very wide range of technology services to people with sight loss, and this would include assessments, uh, demonstrations and training, a one-to-one -one and one-to-many. We also have a dedicated technology help desk, a technology sales line. We deliver podcasts, which I mentioned earlier, our virtual technology clubs. I can go to these services a little bit more in detail later, but it's, it's suffice to say, mm -hmm. there is a very extensive suite of services available. And the key message being that regardless of someone's degree or our type, of sight loss, there's always a piece of technology that's there mm -hmm. to help. And, and I think I, I consider myself extremely privileged, um, fortunate that 
I can see firsthand uh, the the I suppose the the the, the power uh, and reach um, um, importance of technology to someone with sight loss. Um, and how it can remove uh, so many barriers uh, to education and and to employment. I'm mm -hmm. I'm seeing that on, on a daily on a daily basis. So it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's 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 great and respecting mm. anonymity. So we don't want yeah. any yeah. names. But if you think back to some recent examples, could you share some recent real life examples mm. of folks who've come uh, with questions around technology or? With absolutely yeah. potentially a need yeah. for technology to support them yeah. But yeah could you give us some of those cases that you've yeah. come across recently of course of course i would say it's very very diverse so uh, there's a very broad spectrum of roles uh in, in employment of, of people have come across uh, in various different um education uh, with various different education as well um I'd say, guys, we can think of. I can think of almost every profession. Uh, I've, I've met someone working in teachers, clerical officers, doctors, lawyers, accountants, journalists, novelists. I've even had one or two film directors come in for for support. Um, this would be across public sector, private sector, individuals who are self-employed, uh, part-time, and and full-time. Um, sometimes I would be supporting individuals who are who want to stay in in their job. Sometimes they want to transfer. Depends on, on, on their preference. We're here to support them. But I'd like to give, give you some examples uh, of people like I can think of. Um, the first example is, is one thing that stands out the most for me because it was it was when I started off working as an IT trainer uh, in NCBI, and I was assisting a student, and they were considering going back to college in, in, in UCC. And they had done different jobs over the years. I think this person was in maybe their mid twenties, uh, had different jobs, but they wanted to go back and do a uh, physio. And um, they had recognized that their site had deteriorated to a point where magnification wasn't really gonna be of, of significant benefit to them anymore. So they might've used Zoom text, maybe some of the Windows built in magnification features excuse me and then they realized well actually i need to transition to using a screen reader so what i did was i scheduled i think it was maybe six or eight uh one-to-one -one sessions in dublin and this person actually traveled from cork to dublin for one-to-one -one sessions on use of the jaws screen reader and um they have to say they really really just threw themselves at this uh they were determined to get this place in 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 the college they did get it. I remember I'll never forget the text me. It was, it was one of the first um, services that I that I had supported in, in my in my role when I started. And they text me maybe three months after the the training finished to say that oh, I've just been offered a place in in, in the college. And uh, now that wasn't down to me. It was due to the wider network of of supports available from NCBI, including our employment team, but uh, and community resource workers, but. Um, I was delighted uh, to, for, for them and they're working now in, in that area. Um, other examples mm -hmm. I can think of, um, I, a while ago, I was supporting a doctor. Uh, he was an orthopedic surgeon. Um, he recognized that he was not going to be able to continue to do his day-to-day -day role in, in light of a deterioration in sight. Um, so what we did is we explored different options and what actually they found was the most beneficial was a, a, a large hand-tilt digital magnifier, a 10-inch magnifier called the Lucky 10. And what they were going to do with this, they were going to be able to use it to, to consult on, on x-rays. So they weren't going to be able to do, they had to recognize they weren't going to be able to continue on their job as an orthopedic surgeon, but there was other areas uh, in that field that they were able to, to continue to work in. Um, so sometimes it's a bit retention, but perhaps working in a different area uh, within, within, within that field. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have other jobs uh, like accountants. My very first IT assessment was, but it was with an accountant and they were using Excel spreadsheets from nine to five by the looks of it every day, but they were really, really struggling to see different formula on, on, on the spreadsheets. And we had a look at Zoom text, uh, which is screen magnification software. And they tried that, uh, which is available for a free trial. It runs in a, what's called a 40 minute mode. This, uh, uh, this is a Zoom text. And they found that it was working for them. So uh, they purchased that and they're using that to this day. Actually, that person contacted me 
uh, about eight years after my original meeting with him and he's still working as an accountant and using um, Zoom text. Um, Couple two more examples I can think mm -hmm. of are interesting ones. Uh, a journalist um, I've been working with um, supporting, he is using um, iPhone with voiceover to access email. So sometimes it's not the assistive uh, technology. Sometimes it's the mainstream devices, an iPhone or an iPad. And this person was using, he think he gets 300 emails a day, he was saying, but he's using his iPhone. He said it's his lifeline. It's, it's, on, his, it's on him the whole time. And he's able to use voiceover, which is a massive proficiency um to access his email and make uh, calls and so forth and then also another another example i could think of is a novelist so we had uh, someone who um is writing books got to a point where they were not able to uh, make out basically what was on the screen uh, they weren't going to be too comfortable using jaws so what we did was we we trialed some voice dictation software um and uh, there was one called Dragon Naturally Speaking. And uh, they tried using that for a while, it got on quite well. Basically it's, it's speech to text. So we heard of, might have heard of text to speech with JAWS, this is speech to text. And there's a very powerful tool that's built into Microsoft Office applications like Word and Outlook. And that's called Dictate. So with a very good headset, um, he was able to speak uh, to the, uh, to, the uh, to his, on, on, his, on his microphone mm -hmm. and it was coming up very accurately albeit now it would still need to be um to be proofread but uh, still it was a very very helpful tool uh for, for them so mm. that gives you hopefully a sense of the very uh, mm -hmm. broad uh, diverse range of of areas people are working in with sight loss uh key theme being that sometimes people will uh, make the decision to change roles in, the, in their field or sometimes it might be an option to continue in that role um mm -hmm. but there's always a piece of technology that's there to help right. great and mm. it's a it's a nice spectrum you've offered there and hopefully mm. it it speaks to some of the real life scenarios faced by mm. folks participating or watching later mm -hmm. on the recording i wonder if we could sidestep to the topic of grants and supports because a question that comes up a lot uh, for folks either trying to get employment or in employment with changing needs or even employers who are wondering about the cost and the overhead yeah. uh, for reasonable accommodations well, could you share some information around the whole grant support you know how do you get support yeah. is there support available and how do you get it for these kinds of technology accommodations yeah, yeah it's, it's a very good question Brendan and so sometimes it can be a little bit disheartening when you do uh, conduct a full IT assessment and it's oh wow I love this device I love this handheld magnifier I love JAWS and I love this and then you you might say the the, the what the price is and it can be a little bit overwhelming by its nature assistive technology is not cheap unfortunately um but the good news is that there are grants uh to um assist people um in securing funding uh, for that technology and to to elaborate on that a little bit more whether someone is in employment whether they're in education or whether they're using technology in the home the good news is that there is a funding avenue to avail of to uh, um, secure um yeah basically secure funding for, for those devices uh, software and hardware um, focusing specifically on um, employment um in terms of of the service offerings there for for funding um the most popular one would be the workplace equipment adaptation grant so this is funding uh, through the department of employment affairs and social protection and it offers a grant to cover the cost of adaptations needed to accommodate a person with a disability in the workplace and uh, so what ncbi can do is that we can provide you with a quotation for the cost of a comprehensive range of equipment which you can apply for under this grant. Now, my understanding is with this grant, it is, I think it's just over 6,300 euro uh, worth of equipment, both software actually and hardware that can be applied for. Um, the first protocol, um, if you, if anyone here is considering um, applying for funding for, uh, through, through this grant, the first protocol would be to contact the NCBI. And you might say, why? Well, the funding's there and there might be, I know, I know there's a, a website where you can apply for this funding uh, through the Department of Social Protection, but 
um, really best thing to do would be to come in to us, contact NCBI and um, receive uh, an IT assessment. So I mentioned the NCBI labs team earlier. Um, so myself and my colleagues, we work together. And what we can do is we can meet with people who are interested in, um, in for example, exploring different technologies um, for, uh, that they're going to be using in the workplace and to ascertain really what your needs are, uh, your goals, and really work with you uh, to make sure that we can achieve, achieve those goals. And what we do find is that, you know, an individual's IT skills are, are always going to be taken into consideration. And it's really a case then of trying to identify during the IT assessment, you know, what are the key technologies that are going to enable that person to continue their uh, job or perhaps secure a, a position. Um, with the workplace grants, a few kind of considerations as well with that, regardless of whether you're in full or part-time employment, self-employed or, or, or not, um, that grant is, it will be available to you. The only thing I would say with the grant, we have noticed a bit of disparity in terms of how quickly or, or not it takes to secure the funding. And that depends on your local Department of Social Protection office, uh, yes, local uh, uh, intro office. Um, sometimes you can hear back within three weeks, sometimes it can be three months. Um, but the best thing that we can do, or we, we can advise is to get in touch with us, um, have an IT assessment. We will draw up a report with the key recommendations in that report uh, for you. And that could be submitted then along with a completed application form uh, to uh, the intro office. Um, we can also point to the direction of which office that is and who the application should be made out to mm -hmm. um, because we have various contacts sometimes when okay. working with different offices, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, I, and I think from prior meetings, we understand that that's private sector only and it isn't. It is private, it, very good point. It's private right. sector only, Brendan, okay. yeah. yeah. So the public sector, if you happen to be in a civil service or some kind of public sector job, mm -hmm. it's back to your manager and back to the... Mm -hmm. uh, line of exactly. command and the diversity uh, mm. or inclusion officers so we can if you're in that situation mm. um write back or put it in the feedback and we'll see yeah. there have been some cases we've come across and we can certainly try and point mm -hmm. you in the right direction if that's your scenario just yeah. two sub questions because i noticed one of the participants asked mm. is dragons included in mm. that kind of grant support yes it is dragon okay. naturally speaking is included yeah Great. Okay. So if you're interested in that, it's something that's mm. covered under that grant, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're in a private sector scenario. Yeah. And then yeah. the second question come in, one of the participants asked, could you use these kind of grant support as some kind of lever mm. or incentive to make yourself more persuasive in a job interview? Uh, question is absolutely. Uh, you, you can. And um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, what we try to do as well in, in, in the lab, labs team, um, and I should say as, as a slight uh, as a side note, I, I also work in our technology help desk. So this help, the help desk is a, is a um, basically it's a support line where people can call, receive technology support, um, and uh, we can assist with their devices. Um, this is a free service that's available for people with sight loss and their families, but also employers. We do occasionally get calls from employers um, on, on the help desk. Um, so we do, we, we, work, we work with employers to create more awareness around not just the different technologies that are available, but also the grants that are available. I mean, the key, key message here is that there, there is no cost to the employer if the funding is, is approved. I've never seen it not approved. If someone is working in private sector, they apply for the funding. Okay, they, mm -hmm. they may have to wait a little, little while, but it's always, always approved. Um, okay, so, and a lot of employers we find aren't aware of, of this grant. So yeah, it would be, it's a massive, massive um, incentive. So it's of no cost to the employer. Um, and the other consideration here is that our team, the labs team is here to support that person in employment in their journey towards setting up the equipment and uh, making make sure they're fully trained um, at any ongoing support. And that doesn't just apply for the individual, it applies also for uh, the mm -hmm. employer. 
very often we, we like i can give you an example actually guys that last week i got a an email from an employer uh, an insurance company in dublin um i had recommended one of their employees um try out some screen magnification software last year gave them some training in the office that went very well they wanted to have they had some a couple other queries around the software and how compatible it is with some with some applications that they're using so you know that that support that was you know almost a year after mm-hmm. the original assessment. And of course, we're always happy to provide uh, that support okay. uh, in addition to the Great. initial assessment, yeah. Great, so as we wind down the, mm. the interview here, one mm. last question I wanted yeah. to ask JP yes. is, yeah. what is the eligibility criteria? So if someone's listening in now or yeah. later on and they're wondering to themselves, well, that's all well and good. There's all these services available and support, which would probably mm. help. What is the eligibility criteria? Are there any preconditions for a member of the general public in Ireland who's blind or visually impaired to access NCBI lab support? Yeah, okay. Um, so yes, the answer is, it's, uh, in, 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 in short, the answer is yes, that question. Um, there is a referral pathway. Um, if someone wants to avail of all the services of NCBI, and be registered with us. Um, we're happy to take referrals from anyone who is having a significant challenge with their, with their sight and which cannot be improved with you know, conventional correction glasses or medical treatments. Um, three methods of referral um, are available. We have a self-referral, so you can refer yourself. Someone can refer themselves online or to over the phone. Um, a referral can be made through a relative or a friend, um, or it could be a professional referral through a clinician or such as an ophthalmologist or optometrist. Um, so my, re- my general recommendation there would be to, it is better for someone to be referred uh, to our services, to avail a full suite of services. What happens is once, once an individual is referred, you'll receive a call, um, you'll meet with a community resource worker or a CRW, a social worker, and then if that person is interested in receiving technology support, then they'll be referred to an IT trainer, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, And then the IT assessment is conducted and that is key uh, to establish, identify what the needs are of the individual. Um, Now, if for example, and this can happen, if for example, someone does not want to go through the whole referral pathway and they just want to avail of our services, that can be done. And that does, as I say, it does happen from time to time. In that case, my recommendation would be to, well, my recommendation is really to, 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 um, to register with, with the NCBI, but if it's not a, going to be a viable option, okay. I, would, I would be suggesting then taking note of our, of our help desk number, which is a free phone number. It's 1800-911-110. And also, if that can't be noted today, our help desk email, which is labs, L-A-B-S, at ncbi.ie. So if you send an email to labs at ncbi.ie, you have a technology query. We have a team uh, standing by ready to answer that query um, at often Monday to Friday. That's open from nine to five. So mm-hmm. um, really good uh, resource uh, is the labs help desk which you can contact at that email address all right yeah. well jp that's a treasure trove of information you've mm-hmm. shared with us we'll draw this part of the interview to a close so i'll end the recording in a moment and then we'll continue on yeah. offline with some questions so for now thank you very much perfect my pleasure brendan thanks